All right, take 12, interview. I'm learning all these terms today. These television terms, I'm quite enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> So I think there's a, a kind of a nationwide movement of getting back to the artistry of crafting great food. And you know, all of those things are, are movements and ideas that we see coming out of Vermont. It's really the epicenter for the food artisan, for the farmer. So I think with regards to the producers that we're visiting today, Michael at Twig Farm, Andy at Middlebury Chocolates, John at The Alchemist, and Pete at Vermont Salumi, there's kind of a personal dedication, not just to the ingredients, but to the craft, to the process. We're here in West Cornwall, Vermont, visiting who I think is the premier cheesemaker in the country right now. It's Michael Lee at Twig Farm. It's been a long time since you've been here. I know. I'm yeah. excited to see all that's new and, and all that's not. Well, you want to take a walk around the farm? Yeah, it'd be great. Look? Absolutely. Right. I've known Michael for a long time. We actually used to work as cheesemongers together. And now Michael has uh, taken a foray into the cheese making business. Michael's cheeses are really unique because he's creating cheeses in a European style here in America made from milk that's coming from the animals that are raised on his farm. So this is essentially what's considered a farmstead operation and Michael's the artisan. Michael's got about 60 goats here on the property at Twig Farm and about half are dedicated to making milk for the cheese room. What's production like for these guys? I mean, how much are how much milk are they producing for you on a daily or weekly average? Sure. Um, well, like uh, the this this girl, she's one of the top performers. She's still making about uh, ten pounds of milk a day. Wow. Um, and that's two hundred and ten days into her lactation. Um, and then you've got other goats like. Um, like that one, who's only making about four pounds of milk a day uh -huh. um, and has never made much more than that. Uh, so there's a big range. Goats are incredibly friendly. They can be a little bit uh, rambunctious and wild. And they kind of remind me of a giant cat. They're very personable and playful and uh, like to come up and nibble on your zippers. I'm, gonna, I'm about to switch sides. And I'll, and I'll switch. Cheesemaker coming through. So from beginning of end to the process, from, from milk in the vat to cheese draining on the table, how long are we talking? Um, we're talking about seven hours, really. I mean, I start getting the milk into the vat at around 4.30 in the morning. and uh, 4.30 in the morning. And so what, how much are we going to be able to produce out of what's in here? This should be about 100 pounds of cheese. So just breaking up the big curds right now. Yeah. Because um, you're going for a consistent curd size. Yeah, so if the curds um, vary too, or if they're too large, really, is the, the thing. If they're too large, then they're going to contain too much moisture, uh -huh. and you're going to get poor ripening of your cheese. Right, uneven ripening. Yeah. Right. And then, um, then we start stirring, and that's where I am at right now. Stirring uh, typically takes between 35 and 45 minutes, depending on the cheese and depending on the milk. Then we um, drain, and drainage can take 10, 15 minutes or so, um, trying to get all of the free whey out of the vat. So we just have curd left behind. And when we have that, then we start forming, we put all of the curds into forms. That gives the cheese its shape, and that's the cheese making process. So this is incredible, Michael. We're in the cellar, or the cheese aging room, essentially. So this is where the cheeses come after you've made them, after they've drained, and they're dry enough to come into a different environment. Yeah, um, so yeah, after we drain them, they come down here and um, we let them acclimate. So they spend the night down here, cool off, can, uh, finish acidifying, and then we salt them in a brine bath. And then um, they dry and we put them on the wooden boards to age. Uh, like when we finish making the cheese, like a young cheese like that, it's just going to be really bland. It's going to be a little bit milky, uh, very tangy, um, but not much flavor. And 
as the uh, fats and the proteins break down uh, in tandem with the drying effect um, of time just being exposed, then you get different flavors and different textures in the cheese. So can we taste some of these cheeses? Sure, yeah. Awesome. It'd be great. Mmm. Fudgy, dense, tangy. Oh my god, so delicious. It can be found pretty much anywhere a fine retailer exists, right? Or perhaps your favorite restaurants. Perhaps, yes. <laughs> I always kind of tap into my Vermonter when I'm kind of looking at composing plates a lot of times in the kitchen or trying to source ingredients and there's just kind of that mentality of, of focusing on the quality of the product as opposed to set, getting the product out there in the marketplace as much as they can and maximizing their profits. They're not really interested in that. They're really interested in being true to the product and the craft and the experience of, of uh, the production. Welcome to The Alchemist. Wow! Ah, it is hoppy in here. Love it. I'm gonna say these are the empties. These are all the empty cans that get fed into the, into the canning apparatus. From here, the cans move down the assembly line into the injector, the beer injector, where they get injected. They're laughing at me because I don't know what I'm talking about. Look, no top, top. Now, top pressed on for the space that I'm standing in. This is holy ground. It's kind of like getting sprayed by holy water. It's very refreshing. Maybe I can just catch a little. Right there. Hoses. No brewery is complete without hoses. See? They're everywhere. I cannot get in the way of getting the beer to the people. So John, you've created something incredible here. There, there's definitely a cult around Hetty Topper. We came in this morning, I see people standing in line. There's a dude in a hunting vest. There's somebody in a suit. Uh, it doesn't discriminate. So how, how has this happened? It's just taken on a life of its own, you know? I mean, we just set out to do what we do, which is make good beer. Make good beer. There, there's this insane beer culture here in Vermont. And we, what we've been doing this week is visiting artisans who are kind of making the conscious decision to focus on one product, making one product with all of their pride, yep. and, and being satisfied with that. So the same thing exists in the beer world here as well, right? I mean, IPA for 20 years has been my focus, man. I love them yeah. to death. And uh, so when we opened this place, that's all we wanted to do was just put a dynamite IPA in a can and thankfully other people agree and yeah. away it goes, you know? That's awesome. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, the pro like why IPA for you? Why IPA for me? From the first time I tasted hops. I mean, the very first time I tasted hops, it was so shocking to me, I couldn't even believe it. There's something really cool about being able to focus on just one beer. I designed Hetty Topper so it would just be a beautiful drinkable experience with as pleasant a hop experience as you could probably get. There's a line here today, the parking lot's filling up. So where, who's drinking the beer? Where's it going? Everywhere, I mean, it's, it's crazy, it really is. You know, I mean, the reality is, is we self-distribute. We have a small number of accounts. They're all limited as to how many they get. A lot of them only get two cases a week. We have the retail shop here. We limit everybody to one case now. And we're selling out Saturday at like two. You know, so we still can't even get through our sixth day of business and have beer here. And so now we just want it to be the people that are gonna take it and drink it. The progressive food movements in this country are stemming from places like Vermont. Kind of the next evolution of handmade food is, is kind of going through the state right now and I think the ramifications are being felt throughout the country. All right, we're on this for 7.3 miles. Okay. So we're looking for 17 west. This is Virgen's. This is where Middlebury Chocolates is lo 
located. Don't blink. You will miss it. Oh, I see it. Shit. Okay. Okay. Are we good, Griff? We're going to get the shot. We're going to turn right. Coming into Virgen's right now, and this is Daily Chocolate, which is right where Middlebury Chocolates is doing their production, has their facility. We're going to go inside, take a look, eat some chocolate. Ah, good to see hey, you. How are you, man? Doing pretty well. How about you? Great. Happy to be here. You gonna show us around the uh, chocolate factory? If you're ready. I'm ready. <laughs> All right, let's go. Tell me about what is going on here. The smell is insane. I see spinning things oh, okay. and chocolate everywhere. Yeah. I'm getting a little frenzy. We got cocoa beans roasting. We got them grinding over here. And we're basically just eating chocolate all day. So can I come work for you? And when can I start? <laughs> so there's so much to talk about. What's the first thing that you have to do? The first thing you have to do is think of what sort of flavor you want to achieve. Yeah, yeah. And that's, uh, I guess that's where you start thinking about where you want to source your beans from. And so what makes a good cocoa bean? Is it butterfat content? Is it, what are we going for? Yeah, all sorts of factors. You want a well-fermented cocoa bean that, that is also well-dried. Okay. And that's a tough combo to come by. And you just got some in recently, We got right? some awesome cocoa beans from a cooperative in Belize, co-founded by uh, Alex Whitmore, the founder of Taza Chocolate. And what happens when they get here to Middlebury Chocolate? They would bust open the bags and sort through them all and start roasting. Okay, so now we're gonna take the chocolate that's in the tempering machine, pour it into bars. So yes. this is the moment of truth. This is when it all happens. That over there. Uh, where? Uh, Rabbits. No, I don't know. Hey, you've got something on here. This side. On your right, on your cheek. Right on this side over yeah. here. Yeah. Mm. This is what it's all about. Handmade with with pride from scratch. So I think with regards to the producers that we're visiting today, there's a real thought process that goes on with regards to how best to make the, the product with respect for the generations that have come before who've done the same thing. Pete Coleman at Vermont Salumi focuses on making cured meats in a traditional method, but with contemporary technique. We're gonna be visiting Pete to see him create his salamis from authentic ingredients. Hey, Pete. Hey, Matt, welcome. How are you, man? Good to see you. Nice to see you. Thanks for letting us in today. Thanks for coming by. There's a lot to see. There is a lot There's to see. There's hopefully a lot of meat. There's a lot of meat. That's We've why got I'm a here. Cool I'm here for the meat. Yep, I, I can tell you're a fan. <laughs> um, Show me around. Yeah, you want to come yeah, on? Yeah, let's in? do it. All right. Why are you a charcutier? I like to eat it. <laughs> and, Good answer. Uh, I was born in, in Italy and would go back in the summertime and hang out with my family. And I don't know, one day I literally was just throwing back slices of prosciutto before lunch and I went, I want to make this. I can do it, right? Like, so I started there and started working with a couple on-farm slaughter and processors in Italy and came back here with practice. And then people started trying some of what I was making. Like, this stuff's good. How many years have you guys been doing this? We're going into year number three. We're in year number three. And still, I, I'm still learning. You know, I feel like, you know, when I go back to Italy and tell the guys, you know, what I'm doing, they're like, oh, you're still a rookie. Come back in 20 years. And then, <laughs> and then you can talk to us. And I totally agree. What do, we, uh, what do we have planned? Yeah, we'll keep it real simple. We're gonna grind the meat, we're gonna mix it in a meat lug by hand, add some spices, stuff it into a casing. Just grind up some meat, no big deal. You know, just yeah. another day. Just another day. All right, so we gotta get suited up here. Put on the hair net. This should be Is that right? So we're gonna stuff the sausage now. We're gonna stuff it. And I don't want to be too forward, Pete, but that is a mighty big dick you have. Matt, you're pretty forward. All right, I'm gonna pass you the dick. Okay, catching. So this is the stuffer. This is the stuffer. So basically, once we stuff the ground meat in here, pressure is going to extrude the sausage from the stuffer into a casing and back into its own up. intestine. We're in there. See, we're talking shop. Yeah. So, 
Sausage is made, it's stuffed. What happens now? All right, now we can link it. All right, man, I'm hungry. That has been an awesome day. Thank you for having us in. Oh, and of course. Time showing to eat. us around your world. Time to eat, right? How many slices do you want? How many slices of bacon guy are I can, I can I can eat three to four pieces of bacon. All right, all right. Pretty much daily. 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 This is a part of the daily routine here. I will drop the eggs in the middle of the second. Eggs. They're from Michael Lee at Twig Farm. He's been having a bounty of duck eggs. You like pepper? I like pepper. I right, good. And I like salt, too. Me, too. A little salt. And uh, I found a little maple syrup in your fridge. I hope you, you don't mind. I went in your fridge. I wasn't like poking around, but I found a little maple syrup. It's a little sweet it's for your savory pepper. maple syrup, bacon. All right, so I mean, a little sweet, a little salt. Let's try this bacon. A little, a little local love. Oh, that is metal. Your bacon is fantastic. Thank you so much. Sir. Thanks for having us. Safe right, travels. I think, you know, I connect to these guys in a lot of different ways, but these people are the champions of the real food movement in this country. These are the people who are working every day to put food onto tables that is wholesome, that is ingredient driven, that is clean, that is safe, that is delicious, and that has a real focus on history and heritage and, and culture and we're losing a great part of that in our country every day. That's what resonates with me.